So the section we're starting is on the cell membrane today. And the cell membrane is nearly as important of a structure as the DNA. Where the DNA has the instructions how to do things, the cell membrane is going to do a lot of controlling when that DNA does it. So it's also going to be how the cell interacts with everything in the outside world. And our cell membranes are considered to be a fluid mosaic in there. It's amphibolic in terms that it has both an area that likes water and an area that does not like water. So your hydrophobic and hydrophilic region. If we look at that, you've got your phospholipid bilayer. Can you grab one of those black pens off my desk for me? Oh, I have it right here. Never mind. Thanks, Steve. I knew I brought a new one out. So you've got this region here that is hydrophilic, where you've got the phosphate ends on there. And then this region in the middle is going to be hydrophobic, where you've got the fatty acid tails in the middle. And then being that it's a bilayer with the fatty acids in the middle, you have a hydrophobic region on the inside and a hydrophobic region on the outside. So you can have watery substances inside the cell and outside the cell. And they don't want to cross over this membrane because they would have to pass through this region here that is not water friendly in there. By fluid mosaic, we tend to want to look at it and say those are all together. But if you think of it more being like a bunch of balls that are sitting on a flat tray, like when you play on a pool table, you have that triangle, you put them in. And as long as there's an empty space, you can rearrange those balls in there. You don't have to take them out. That's actually what this is arranged like. It's more of the fluid mosaic in there where things move around in there. So you've got your phospholipid bilayer in there, and then you've got various proteins in there. So you've got your striped balls in there, and then you've got some solid ones that float around and can rearrange and move within that in there. And that's the current membrane model. That has not always been the membrane model. In 1915, membranes from red blood cells were analyzed and found to be both lipids and proteins. So they were making big progress then to know what cell membranes were. But remember, it was only in the 1800s before we actually got to see cells. So the knowledge can't be possibly that old. By the 1960s, Dawson and Daniel sandwich theory of the phospholipid bilayer between two layers was widely accepted. So that's when we got this idea that, OK, we do have this phospholipid bilayer, but we didn't understand that it moved around. And then in 1972, Singer and Nicholson proposed the membrane proteins were dispersed and individually inserted into the phospholipid bilayer with the hydrophilic regions protruding in there. So the proteins actually kind of extend out beyond. So it's not completely flat. You've got little bumps in there, in that layer where the membrane sticks out. So the fluidity, the adjacent phospholipids can switch positions rapidly. They can switch positions 10 to the seventh times per second in there. So that's over a million times per second that they can switch positions in there. So that's pretty quick. Proteins are larger and slower. Many proteins are going to drift in a highly directed manner. Some are going to be attached to the cytoskeleton in there. So some are going to be anchored inside and everything else is drifting around them. Others, it tends to be not random where they're going to drift it actually has a direction that they're going to move on the cell membranes in there. And they remain fluid until the temperature drops and solidifies. So that's one of the reasons why bodies need to stay at a certain temperature. When a body temperature drops in there, you move to a less than ideal temperature in there, and it tends to slow things down. 
cholesterol is going to make the membranes less fluid at body temperature by restraining movement, which is good. You don't want them to be too fluid either. It's going to help hinder packing at low temperatures required to solidify. So the cholesterol actually makes us able to tolerate a wider range of temperatures in there. So if you didn't have cholesterol in your membranes, you wouldn't be able to survive in some of the colder temperatures or some of the warmer temperatures in there. Good news is even if you are a vegan and you don't eat animal products, your body will make the cholesterol you need. So membrane proteins, there's over 50 kinds of proteins found so far in the plasma membranes of red blood cells alone. So odds are we will not identify all of these in here. And with that many of them, also the good news is you don't need to know all of those. We'll just talk about classes of proteins and a few key important ones in there. So the integral proteins are gonna be ones that are gonna penetrate the hydrophobic core of the lipid bilayer. They integrate, they go all the way through. And a more specific type of those are the transmembrane proteins that span the entire membrane. So some of them are not going to go through the other hydrophobic layer of the, or the other hydrophilic layer of the integral proteins, but the transmembrane ones are the ones that go all the way across. So if we were to draw it on here, integral transmembrane goes all the way across. So that's the difference in them. And then the peripheral proteins are appendages bound to the exposed parts of the integral proteins. So you can have stuff attached onto those for the outside of the cell in there. So the integrins are gonna be integral proteins that attach to fibers of extracellular matrix. So then you can have this extracellular matrix out there, in there, that can attach to it as well. So there's six major functions that the proteins of the plasma membranes do. They're gonna transport things. So when you wanna move things in and out of cells, not everything is able to cross through this. A lot of stuff is not. The proteins provide a place where things can get in and out of the cell. They can be involved with enzyme activity in there. So if you're a prokaryotic cell, you're really relying on enzymes in here because you don't have structures inside your cell to do that. They can help facilitate other chemical reactions. Signal transduction, so if you need to send a signal out to the outside world or receive a signal from the outside world. They can do cell-to-cell -cell recognition. So when a cell needs to bind onto another cell, that's how you can recognize it. That's one of the key things that goes on with your immune cells is they need to be able to recognize the cells that are yours and leave them alone. Then we've got intercellular joining in there where they can join cells together. And then attaching the cytoskeleton and the extracellular matrix. They help hold things together inside the cell and outside the cell. So with your intercellular joining, that's how tissues hold together in the body is through intercellular joining in there. So some of the carbohydrates that are in the membrane are involved with cell-to-cell -cell recognition. We have these glycolipids, which are short membrane carbohydrates that are gonna be covalently bound to the lipids. So glycolipid means sugar and lipid hooked together in there. And then glycoproteins are lipids and proteins hooked together in there. A lot of variation on these on both sides with the carbohydrates and the proteins, and they can serve as markers. So there's certain markers that we know will go on cells with different diseases in there. 
There's one that's the HLA B28 that goes with a lot of different diseases out there. So what they can do is take some of the person's blood and look to see are these markers on their cell. When you have different markers, different genes for different markers that can possibly be out there, they know certain diseases have a higher correlation with people who have a certain marker in there. So it's a way of screening to see if you have potential diseases or if you can potentially have those diseases in there. And there are lots of those. They just get numbered in there, so at least the naming type is consistent. HLA is for human lymphocyte antigen, and that's a real common way of naming them. Synthesis and sightedness of membranes, they do have a directional orientation, so the membrane proteins in lymph lipids are synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum and then they get converted to glycoproteins in there. The glycoproteins are mod modified in the Golgi apparatus to become glycolipids and then transmembrane proteins, your membrane glycolipids and the secretory proteins get transported to vesicles in the plasma membrane. And then the vesicle will fuse with the membrane and that will release the secretory proteins, the glycoproteins and the glycolipids that are positioned on the outside. So you basically, you make this stuff in the endoplasmic reticulum, you put it through that Golgi apparatus, it's gonna come into a vesicle and when it gets to the membrane, this vesicle is gonna come along and where they fuse like that, it then creates an opening and the stuff comes out. So it's kind of like if you're chewing gum and you stick your tongue through that gum, it just fuses it, it bursts the membrane and brings it out. This just fuses with the membrane in there and blends in. You're going to have the lipids more in the smooth ER. The protein components will be more in the rough ER because they need the ribosomes to make the proteins that go with it. Yes, you have Golgi apparatuses in most of your cells in there. Red blood cells don't, but they're kind of an odd one in human cells. So what results in this selective permeability is having both the nonpolar and polar molecules in there. Your nonpolar, things that are going to be permeable to the lipid bilayer itself are nonpolar hydrocarbons. They have to be really small in there. So things like carbon dioxide and oxygen are actually hydrophobic. They're polar, but they're really small and can get through. Cholesterol can get through this because of its shape. But otherwise, it's got to be really small, nonpolar things to get through there. The hydrophobic core impedes the passage of ions and polar molecules in there. Most of your big polar things, like water, isn't going to go through here. Ions don't want to go through here, where they have a charge on them. To go into this area where there's non charged things, it they're not going to go into that neighborhood in there. So because of that being limited, who can just freely cross that membrane, we have the transport proteins that will be permeable to specific things. So a protein will usually be pretty specific in what it's going to allow in. One protein, just because you're a protein carrier doesn't mean that's where everything goes in and out. Certain things have to go in and out with certain proteins in there. So some are going to allow hydrophilic substances to avoid contact with the lipid bilayer in there, particularly your channel proteins. They're going to be a hydrophilic channel in the center that certain molecules and ions will use because it's an area they're comfortable with. When you look at how chemicals are going to interact and dissolve with each other, where they're going to want to hang out, like goes with like. If it's polar, it wants to be with other things that are polar, meaning it's got a charge or the electrons are not evenly distributed. If everything is symmetrical and it's nonpolar, 
those things are happiest with other nonpolar things in there. So aquaporins are going to be channel proteins that are specific to allowing water to go in and out. And then your carrier proteins can hold a chemical passenger and change shape to shuttle them across. So that's used for translocation. And not all cells are going to do translocation. But essentially, you would have another protein that could grab it here, change its shape, and shuttle it across and take it to the other side. So we obviously can have some pretty big size variation in all of this stuff going through there. So with passive transport, passive tells you it's a process that does not require any energy to do it. So this is where a substance is going to be able to diffuse across the membrane in there, and it's not going to take any energy at all. What it's going to rely on is the concentration gradient. So if you have a membrane separating substances, in there, you have more of the X's on this side of the membrane than you do over here. Diffusion is going to naturally want to bring some of these over here on this side of the membrane and make them equal on both sides. So that's what we talk about with passive diffusion in there. It doesn't take any energy. If these are able to cross, they're going to just float across and this is naturally going to balance out to be equal on both sides. That's going to have a lot to do with your water balance in there. So osmosis is going to be the diffusion of water to selectively across the membrane. The water wants to have things be in equal concentration on both sides as well. So wherever, say this is sodium, water is going to follow sodium. And you've got a slug in your yard. And he's got a pretty soft membrane on his back. If you haven't touched one, they'll be out in spring. Pick one up, you'll remember it for good. They're gross. So you have the slug and you sprinkle some salt on his back. What's going to happen is you've got that sodium on his back. It can't get across the membrane to get in there. It's an ion. So what is going to happen is it's going to pull the water across the slug. It wants to dilute the sodium on his back to the same concentration that the sodium is in his body and it will end up dehydrating the slug in there to try and pull that water out. So if you put enough on there, what will happen is the slug looks like beef jerky when you're done. And so the same thing is going to happen with your cells. If you were to give a person an IV of just plain water, what's going to happen is inside your cells is not just plain water. You've got lots of solids in there. They can't get out, so the water is going to rush into that cell, your red blood cell, and cause it to burst in there. So that's why the osmotic balance is so important. The osmotic balance is a way that we try and preserve food in there. If you're, when you're making beef jerky in there, meats a lot of times are preserved with salts in there to try and disrupt the osmotic balance of the microbes that would grow on there. If you make jam or jelly, you use sugar for it. If you don't have cell walls, you usually cannot tolerate excessive losses or gain of the water in there. Plants are a little bit more protected because the cell wall is going to protect them from losing the water so easily. Animal cells are not as well protected in there. You have your skin that's largely waterproof that protects you inside. But if your inside cells are exposed to air in there, they're going to lose water really rapidly in there. They're not protected from it. So we talk about the tonicity. It's the ability of a solution to gain or lose water in there. One that is isotonic means it's going to be the same concentration on both sides. 
So water can flow both directions in there, but you're not gonna have a net gain of water moving to one side or the other. Hypertonic means that it's too concentrated. Hyper is too much. So, or it's got too much water in there. So it's gonna lose water to its environment and it will shrivel up and die. If it's hypotonic, water is going to enter the cell faster than it leaves and it will burst in there. So that's one of the reasons why saltwater fish have to stay in salt water and freshwater fish generally have to stay in salt water. Salmon are kind of an odd example in there that can handle both. But if you take your freshwater fish and you go dump them in Puget Sound and you say, I'm tired of having this little home aquarium, they're not going to live in the salt water in there. It's going to throw off the osmotic pressure in there for them. So osmo regulation is just the control of water balance in there. In cells that do have cell walls, turgor is the cell firmness due to swelling and the inelastic walls exerting pressure back on each other. So it's a healthy state for most plants to be in. They want to have enough water in them that it's putting pressure against the cell wall and when it doesn't, it kind of contracts in. So when you look at when plants start to wilt, they've lost the turgor in there. You have pl plasmolysis in there. So if it's put in a hypertonic environment in there where it's, say you were to put it in salt water in there, it's going to lose water. The plant's going to shrink down and wilt in there. So you can usually have a little bit of fluctuation in there that a plant will live. With that, there are some plants that once it gets wilted, they're not real good at transporting the water back up. I think it's like these Gerber daisies or something like that, that they're a big daisy flower that it's kind of funny. You can have them like completely dump over and put water in it. And within the hour, the thing will stand back up. They're really resilient like that. Yeah. Those are the only kinds of house plants that will stand a chance with me because if you don't bark and ask for it, you don't usually get food or water in my house. So facilitated diffusion, this is going to be aided by transport proteins. So the, the passive in there, it goes based on the concentration in there. Doesn't matter what the proteins are around it in there. Some of them need the help of a transport protein in there. And usually that's going to be very specific. If you need a transport protein to get in and out of the cell, the cell can regulate how much of you comes in and out. With diffusion, the cell doesn't really get to regulate that. It's based on laws of chemistry, too concentrated, not concentrated in there. So with water, the aquaporins in there are going to facilitate water transport much faster. A little bit of water can actually get across that lipid bilayer, but it's very slow to do it. So the aquaporins are going to be the way that most of it will go. The gated channels, not graded. are going to be channel proteins that are ion channels that will open and close in response to a stimulus. This is what your sodium channels are in a muscle. So they've got a gate. It's only going to move things one way unless the gate opens in there. And a stimulus can cause the gate to open. So with your muscles, when you send the nerve message down to open the gate, the sodium channels open and that allows the muscle to contract. When that message is not coming from your nerves, it stays closed and it just keeps moving sodium out. You actually spend about a third of your daily calories moving sodium out of your muscle cells. So glucose transporters, these are gonna undergo subtle changes in shape to translocate the cell you binding site across a membrane. So what's something that a glucose transporter is gonna need to work in a human. What is something a glucose transporter would need in a human? What do you need to be able to absorb the glucose into your cells? Insulin in there. Sure. 
So if you don't have insulin, your glucose transporter is not going to work. So active transport, active in there is the key word that tells you it uses energy in there. And this is going to move solutes against their gradient. So if it's passive, it's working with the gradient, you wouldn't want to waste your energy doing something that's naturally going to happen anyway. You have to use energy if you want to work against the gradient, and that's what sodium potassium pumps do in the muscle like that. So the need for energy in active transport is that it's going to enable the cells to maintain internal conditions that are different than what the outside is. And they're going to get that energy from ATP. ATP is the energy currency that all of your cells will use in there. So with your muscle cells, what they want to do is have potassium inside and sodium outside. So every time you use the muscle, you open the gate and the sodium comes back in. So you have to spend energy to continue moving it back out so that you can contract that muscle again. But you have a different environment inside the cell where you don't have all of this sodium than you do on the outside. So that is your sodium potassium pump that's going to do that. So the sodium potassium pump, you're going to have cytoplasmic sodium that binds to the pump in there, it's going to increase, when it does that, it increases its affinity for sodium. It wants even more of it. And it's going to stimulate phosphorylation by ATP, so it's going to take the energy from the ATP. It's going to change shapes and release the sodium on the outside. Once it does that, that new shape likes potassium. So it will grab a potassium from the outside and bring it to the inside. And it does it in a ratio of moving three sodiums out, two potassiums in. Then it loses the phosphate, goes back to its original shape. It no longer wants to hold on to potassium, so it lets it go on the inside, and it grabs sodium again. So it just kind of alternates between shapes in there. And when it's got sodium, it wants to change and do this, it wants to let go of it then. Then when it grabs potassium, it wants to go back to this shape, take it back to the inside, back and forth. Let me put on a little video clip of the sodium potassium pump in there. Yes. What you end up with is more salt inside, so you're having to work to get it out. Because part of the way the muscles work is they need to have that gradient established where they're separated. So if you have too much in here, you're not going to have a very good gradient in there. Likewise, if you don't have any of it, you don't have the gradient either. So it will make it more inefficient in there. So. Yes. Yeah, that's the reason why salt makes you retain water is it just water naturally follows it. So any place you have salt, it's trying to dilute it. So when you have too much, you just keep trying to dilute it, and dilute it, and dilute it in there. So this is a little animation of it here.
So you could see where it was hauling it out. I know you probably can't hear it up here, and the speakers don't work with this computer. Come on, let's take it the other way now. Yeah, this is your phospholipid bilayer, and this is your sodium potassium pump. So what it does is it moves your three sodiums out. Now that those are out, it's changed shape, and it's going to want to move two potassiums in. Does that happen in all your cells, or like your muscular cells? It happens in your muscle cells a lot, but other cells do it too. It's a really common mechanism in there. Yeah, to be able to spread nerve impulses or another type of cell that's going to do it. Little epithelial cells, no, that are, yeah, neurons do a lot of this. That's how they send information. Let me see if this one will play any better in there since, oh, I don't want 10 minutes. So you've got your sodium going in. It's using an ATP. It's going to change shape. Does it make a little more sense after getting to see it move back and forth across like that? So your cells just basically do a whole bunch of that in there. So why do we need to do this? One of them is to maintain membrane potential. When we talk about potential like that, it's the potential to do work. And it's going to create an electric potential, meaning it's going to do work using electricity. So it will establish a voltage across the membrane. It's just like a battery where you've got voltage created by separating the positives and negatives. So say you've got a big C battery here. You've got the positive terminal and the negative terminal in there. That's what it's creating is a positive and a negative by separating ions in there. And so when you allow these to come together in a battery, you stick the battery in the toy, you turn on the power, it allows that connection to be made, the charges move. They're doing work for you in exchange for the charges to get to come back together. They're powering the toy. Same thing in the cell. It's going to do work for you by opening up the channels and allowing those sodiums and potassiums to get to come back to the other side of the membrane and mix back up again. So the electrochemical gradient is going to force the cations into the cell and the anions out to create a concentration gradient and electrical force. 
separating the positives and negatives. The electrogenic pump, the main one in animal cells is your sodium potassium pump in there. Another one that you'll see is a proton pump in plants, fungi, and bacteria. What they're going to do is they're going to pump so or hydrogen out of a cell. And so you have those positive charges of the hydrogen ion that want to come back and be with negative charges. And you use it to synthesize ATP by letting them come back in. You use the work to put phosphate on ATP then. Okay, we are almost done today. So co-transport, this is going to be coupled transport by a membrane protein. With co-transport, it's an ATP pump that's going to transport a specific solute in there, driving active transport of other solutes. So as this one substance is moved this way across the membrane, another one gets moved the opposite direction in there with co-transport in there. So this is going to be how plants are going to translocate sucrose against a concentration gradient. They use the hydrogen ion to do that. So in exchange for moving sucrose one direction, you'll allow a hydrogen to go the other way in there. So that's going to be how we move smaller things. Bulk transport is going to be bigger things that go across a cell membrane. So exocytosis is going to be used to move things out. Exo means to exit in there. This will excrete biologically active molecules by fusing the vesicles with the plasma membrane. So it would be kind of like if you had a line of people that were all holding hands, and I walk into that line, and I bleh, spit something out. That's essentially what the vesicle is doing is it's going to go up to the membrane. It's got a membrane around it too. It joins its own membrane into the line and spits out its contents in there. Endocytosis is gonna take things in, so endo is in. And this is the way you'll get bigger things in. There's a couple ways that you can do this. One is phagocytosis. So this means cell eating, phago or phage is something to eat like that, cyto is cell. The cell will engulf a particle by wrapping a pseudopodia around it. A pseudopodia means false foot. Essentially the cell goes up to something and it wraps its body around it and takes it in, is what's going to happen. So if you were to look at a drawing of that, you have your chunk here, your cell comes up wraps itself around it so that eventually it's got the chunk in there and then it's going to break down the membrane around the chunk so that it's mixed to the inside in there. And the way it breaks down the chunk, you have a lysosome go in there, breaks down the wall and does whatever it needs to in breaking down the chunk. Penocytosis means cell drinking, and this is going to take droplets into a vesicle. This is how you would take in solutes. This is one of those terms that I have never seen it used outside of a textbook. When we look at cells, they're generally in a suspension of water anyway, if you're looking at a living cell. If you're looking at one that's not living, it's been fixed onto a slide and it's preserved that way. But any other cell, if you're looking at it and it's still alive, it's usually in a watery suspension. To us, they're dissolved in the water. So in terms of what you can see with the naked eye, it's all water, yet we refer to it as endocytosis or phagocytosis in there. Receptor-mediated endocytosis, this is going to be used to acquire a bulk amounts of substances even though they may not be concentrated in the extracellular fluid. So this is a way of getting in things that are diffuse outside. What you have are these receptor proteins in these coated pits in there that are going to have ligands in there that are kind of sitting out there waiting to grab the stuff. 
And after they grab a bunch of it, then they take it into the pit and take it in. Rather than just every time there's a little one going through all the effort of moving one little thing through the pit, you fill the pit and then take it in. And there with the receptor mediated endocytosis. So being that unit eight is on membrane structure and function, I know that that one, I would have included that in on taking the test in. Oh, I copied this in twice, didn't I? <coughs> or no, unit eight's the intro into metabolism. Okay. This is where things were going really wrong for me in terms of the auto formatting going crazy in there. We're not going to start metabolism today. There's no way I'm starting that after you had a test and part of a lecture. So we will wrap things up today.